It is the Joe Lorian Show along with Tanner Saunders. I am at the Farmhouse Studios and Tanner is at his house. Tanner, how are you? Good. I'm still at the ping pong table and uh, you know, just trying to wait this thing out, but uh, we're just here chilling, having a good time, and ready to put on a good show for everyone out there today. Now, you can go ahead and be honest now, Tanner. Now, you, you gave me some bad news this week. Things in your world are not going splendidly. Is that correct? That is correct. My uh, dad's girlfriend, who me and my dad live with, uh, tested positive for COVID-19 earlier this week. Now, But as far as I know, neither one of us have it, and we've been taking the ne necessary precautions, you know, in addition to making sure she's healthy. We've been washing our hands, going out of our way to not touch doorknobs and refrigerators and cupboards and all that, using our shirts to grab onto it. I keep my bottle of hand sanitizer with me at all times, so it was a little uh, scary there for a moment, but last I heard, which was yesterday morning, my dad said she had gone three straight days without a fever, so it looks like she's starting to come out of it, and it uh, seems like we don't have it, so while it was kind of a scary situation there for a moment, it looks like we're all going to be okay, but uh, we are in mandatory quarantine here for the next two weeks, but uh, seems like she's going to be okay, and me and my dad are both healthy, so I guess that's uh, the best news you could ask for at this point. No doubt about it. Hold on just one second here. Let me, I, I'm, I'm putting my foam, my foam uh, microphone, uh, windscreen, mic condom on just in case you, you, you send anything down the line to me. Now, Tanner, uh, is she still staying with you or is she at her own place now? No, we uh, we live in her house. When I, we, when I first uh, moved in, we moved in with her so she hasn't really had uh, much of a place to go and she couldn't even go anywhere if she wanted to because uh, obviously once you get the virus it's a mandatory 14-day uh, quarantine right. so we're pretty much stuck with her but like I said <laughs> that sounds bad I shouldn't say that but uh, <laughs> not much we can do we're gonna clip that and send it to her okay yeah. oh, very good now, I'm sure my now, dad I'm sure my dad will uh, show this to her once he <laughs> hears it now Tanner does not live in Horn Alley, does not live in Steubenk County. Now, you don't have to tell me where she works, but what does she do for a living, Tanner? Does, I'm assuming she works, right? Yeah, she works in the field of education, not necessarily directly with children, but kind of like a Head Start type thing that helps, you know, at-risk youth. She works in that industry. Now, was she already not working or working from home when she found this out? They were starting to phase her out and have her work at home, but it's possible that she could have gotten it, you know, at work, you know, in those last couple of days. It's been about a week and a half she's been sick now, but uh, not exactly sure where it came from. That would be my guess is just, you know, in those final couple of days right before they kind of phased her out and made her work from home, which is really inopportune timing. But what can you do? I was just going to ask, does she know where she may have got it? Was it from a coworker? Does she think maybe she just got it going to a store? I'm not entirely certain. I haven't... Uh, asked her much about it or gotten gone into too much detail because she's been sick as a dog as you would imagine these past right. couple of days so you've just been letting her chill out on the couch watch some netflix do a whole lot of sleeping so uh maybe once she comes around probably would go into more <laughs> detail but for now we're just letting her get as much rest as possible and heal up and beat this thing well, did now so did did the rest of her uh, now if they were all kind of going to the um, isolation and, and quarantine, maybe this doesn't matter. But I wonder. So did the rest of her coworkers once they found out she had it? Did they have to immediately uh, go into quarantine because they had been in contact with her just like you? Again, I'm not entirely certain. I haven't really prodded around and asked, but. Uh... I would assume so because, you know, this thing is serious, obviously, and anyone that comes right. in close contact is going to be, you know, uh, probably going to be questioned and seen, you know, when they had contact with her last and who was in close contact. So, obviously, me and my dad have been exposed to it, so we're 
there's uh, no doubt about it that we got to stay quarantined. But as far as her coworkers go, again, that's something uh, I don't know. I don't even know if she knows that, how much she's been in contact with them or what information she's given. Like, we had someone from the health department over the other week. I'm not sure if they got that information from her, but uh, I would assume that uh, a couple people maybe at work that she had close contact with have had to... Uh, go under the gun in terms of questioning but again i'm not entirely certain and now you again you don't have to say where he works but what field does your dad work in he is i guess you would call it an engineer the technical term is a process technician so he uh, cuts grinds and welds all day as he as he says now was he already working from home in quarantine when he found out the news about your uh, about his girlfriend uh, nope, he was still going in every day. He works not like a factory, but it's a job that requires you have to be there. You can't really do the type of stuff he does from home. So unfortunately, he was still working, but uh, that's obviously going to change. Right, right. Uh, and I'm assuming he had to let the people he works with know that uh, he has to quarantine now? And I believe so. I'm pretty sure he got in contact with his uh, HR department and let them know and then they in turn will go to the people that he was working with. Luckily there was not many people uh, in the building with him. He was one of four people that was still there so luckily in that situation not many exposed but then that's the thing about this virus is you know one person could expose it to you know even a small group of people like that and then they have the people that they interact with and that's how we've gotten in this whole kerfuffle to begin with. Right. Now, how are you feeling? Have you uh, felt any of the side effects? No, I have not. I've been completely asymptomatic, which my dad was telling me, you know, you got to be careful, you know, because she could have gotten it from me or from him or from anyone. But I have been completely asymptomatic. I've been checking my fever just as a precaution for the past few days. I will say it has gone up every day. It went from 97.9 to 98 right on the dot, and it was 98.2 this morning. But uh, I think I'm okay because that is a perfectly normal temperature. So I have been fine and, you know, just trying to take the necessary precautions like I said trying not to touch things that I don't have to I stay strapped with my bottle of hand sanitizer at all times so you know you can never be too careful I mean I'll admit it I was one of those people when this thing first started spreading around Europe I'm like man this this virus of I'm not scared of no virus, but when it gets into your living room, suddenly you have a different perspective. So just been trying to yeah. take the necessary precautions, and uh, so far I'm good, thankfully. And uh, prayers up to my dad's girlfriend, Kim. Hopefully she feels well soon. Seems like she's on the right track. So uh, hopefully we'll all be good and we can make it out of this unscathed. It is. It's, it just goes that fast. It's just like a, a game of tag, right? And it, you're trying to find out, you know, who tagged who first. If 20 people, you know, tagged each other, it can just spread so fast that, you know, like you said, your dad had to let his work know. Then they got to contact who he was in contact with and then whoever they contact with. Because if you don't do that... Uh, it could just continue to, to try anything. So, you know, it's been a fluid story. We talked about it last week. Um, Jeff Passan from Yahoo came out and said baseball was going to try to do something in Arizona, move all the teams to Arizona, uh, play out there because they, they play the Grapefruit League in spring training. Uh, Major League Baseball shot that down a couple hours after the report came out. They said they were talking about it and uh, discussing it, but no decision had been made dana white who i've interviewed in the past and you know i appreciate dana he's a hard worker he's a self-made man he started out with nothing you know the ufc is a, essentially him he built it up he got some investors he built it up then they sold it for a ton of money he still runs it so he's used to fighting the odds he's used to being told you can't do it so he had to move ufc 249 from new york one of the main events, one of the wrestlers from Russia, uh, he can't come because he's quarantined in Russia. So he moved it to California. Well, obviously, there's, there's still the social distancing and um, work from home laws and everything like that. So Dana uh, tried to get a little 
creative, and you know you can't uh, you can't knock the guy for not being creative. So he he went to a casino uh, that was owned by a tribe on Indian land that is not necessarily um, at the behest of state or federal law. And at first they were like, you know, at first they were okay with it. And then what they were going to do is they were going to have matches in different rooms, right, to spread out the people so that not everybody is in one room. There wasn't going to be any fans. And then I don't know if the it was on this island or or not, but because I, I think because I, I think it was is in California. And so uh, one of the uh, politicians out there. She was like, no, this, this, you know, you're still going to have people flying in from California, you know, driving around. Um, it, it's, you know, it's just not a good idea. So then Dana thought, well, he just rent a private island and have the event there. But his media partners, uh, because the, the, it would be on pay-per-view, and I'm sure they would make money on the pay-per-view with no one being there. Uh, pay-per-view channel, ESPN, and their parent company, Disney told them, listen, you know, you got to back down. We don't want to be part of this. And, you know, we don't want you to continue to push this issue. And, you know, we need you to kind of, you know, step back and uh, and stand down. So yesterday, Dana White did finally say that it is postponed for now and that uh, they'll make it up at some point, which, you know, I I appreciate he was trying to be creative. I appreciate he wanted to bring people entertainment because people are complaining there's nothing to watch. But Tanner, ultimately, I think, you know, I think uh, it's probably a good thing because if if anybody had gotten it or they'd brought it to California or brought it to the island from wherever they had come from, given it to somebody, that person didn't know, that person comes back to the States, and then, again, it, it could continue to uh, perpetuate. So, I know Dana's upset, but it's probably the right thing to do. Yeah, I mean, you, you can't help but appreciate, you know, the, the, I guess, the wherewithal and just trying to make it happen. I mean, that's the kind of work ethic that you could say got him to where he is today. But at this point, you know, this thing is, you know, bigger than just a sporting event. You know, we all have to try and come together and be on the same page, you know, to try and knock this thing out as soon as possible and while like I said you can appreciate the effort and you know wanting to bring the people some form of light in, other, in an otherwise dark time but I think you know this COVID-19 situation is bigger than that and it just wouldn't make sense because there's a lot of moving parts that people don't see when it comes to these sort of productions you know the UFC probably has their own people you know that travel and have their own staff and then you know the fighters involved might bring their own clique so there's a lot of moving parts and a lot of people involved behind the scenes that you don't necessarily see during the final product so you know, puts a lot of people at risk, and I think it's just the safest at this point to, uh, you know, kind of let it go and just hope for this thing to blow over quickly, and then you can get it done another day because this thing is serious. And you know, the more people have to travel unnecessarily, it's not going to slow this thing down any quicker. No, and you know, like we we said last week, it's like six degrees of, of separation right with this thing it, it kept getting closer and closer in regards to people you know and in your circle and in your inner circle and obviously tanner as you mentioned right in your living room and it, it finally you know um uh hits home now you have we've not been going to the radio station but if you if we had then i would have to quarantine because we would have been in contact so uh, that is why these social distancing rules are in place to try to flatten the curve. Now, my sister, my mom and my sister live in Dallas. And my my mom and sister want to come home in June um, to see the family. And there's some things going on, although I don't think these things are probably going to be going on because of this. But my sister's like, oh, man, it's a, you know, it's a great, it's a great time. I can get us tickets for $70. I'm like, yeah, of course it's going to be cheap. I, can't, I mean, I would never fly right now or take a cruise or do anything like that. That is, unless it is absolutely an emergency, um, professionally or private, 
uh, in your personal life. I just, uh, I wouldn't do it for luxury. I, I get it. It's like, man, these tickets, boy, how attractive. But it's uh, there's a reason they're that attractive. It's because the airlines are suffering, and they need people to fly so uh you just got to watch out for that now how tanner how you doing after the mcdonald's challenge how long that take you to recover from last week oh my goodness you know i don't want to get into too graphic detail because this is a radio station and i don't want the fcc you know calling my phone or knocking on my door although i doubt they would do that during this time but still i don't want to hear <laughs> from them but uh, i there may or may not have been some food that was rejected like a fake id by my stomach and i may or may not have had to finish the show while sitting on the porcelain throne if you know what i'm saying but uh you know it it was, I can certainly say that uh, for a fair amount of time afterwards that uh, the effects of that challenge were not pleasant. But I made it, and I'm here, and uh, from from uh, what you told me here, we, we have another food challenge today. But it's not going to be as taxing on the stomach, I don't think. So, no. you know, that one was no, rough. This is, mu- this is much easier. Yeah, that one was rough, but uh, I'm glad it's over now and we're on to something that won't upset my stomach too bad. Well, we're going to take a break uh, here in uh, just a couple seconds, and then uh, we're going to chat with Jeff Striegel from the Motor Racing Network. But the chat now, and uh, again, I didn't see anybody that was able to do this McDonald's challenge yet anyways. What we want to do today is the jelly jelly bean. (laughs) More power to you if you're Uh, able to finish that. It's crazy. Yeah. Absolutely. And again, NFL players haven't been able to do it. Um, so it's uh, now probably a competitive eater like Joey Chestnut or uh, Kobayashi might be able to do it. But um, so it's the Ronald Reagan Jelly Bean Challenge. Now, Ronald Reagan, if you don't remember, um, was our president uh, for, I believe it was uh, two terms, eight years. He loved jelly beans, okay? He loved them so much they got shipped to the White House for him. So the Jelly Bean Challenge is. You don't even actually have to eat anything. The challenge is how many jelly beans can you get in your mouth while still be still being able to say and it being audible, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down that, that wall. So we'll do that later in the show. Do you have any guesses on how many uh, jelly beans you can get in your mouth and still be able to say that, Tanner? Well, I did get the uh, the tiny little ones, the jelly belly ones. So I, I think... Okay. With that said, I can fit more than if they were those big honking ones. So I would say maybe about forty-five, fifty. But uh, there's only one way to find out, and that's to do it. And I am excited to <laughs> do that. Well, it was either that or the push-up challenge. And the push-up challenge is the co-founder of Fa- Fantasy Labs, uh, uh, Jonathan Bales. He put out a uh, a challenge and, and had Vegas put odds on it. He At first he said he could do 36 uh, 100 push-ups in 12 hours. He then relinquished that. He said he could do 2,400 push-ups in 12 hours, and somebody bet him $2,000 uh, that he could not do that. So we'll tell you how that turned out. I'm not going to make Tanner do <laughs> 2,400 push-ups, although I did think about it for a while, but I decided uh, since the show is only two hours, that wouldn't really work so well. So uh, let's take a break. We'll come back. We'll talk to Jeff Striegel from Motor Racing Network. He's one of their great announcers. Uh, We'll get his thoughts. Obviously, he's been shut down as NASCAR has. We'll see how he's doing, his thoughts on, you know, what NASCAR is thinking about if and when they come back. And so much more. We also have Dave Stone coming on from NoonsMagician.com. Talk a little SU basketball and football as well. Let's take a break, and we'll come back. It's the Joe Lorian Show on 92.1 The Team. The service department at Maple City Dodge is open. Automotive service work is essential work, and Maple City Dodge is able to assist. They're asking customers to allow them to work with minimal contact, so they'll happily pick up, sanitize, and return your vehicle. The sales department is also available. You can talk to one of their sales guys. They're working from home and making great deals. To set an appointment with service or sales, call Maple City Dodge or reach out to them through Facebook Messenger. Maple City Dodge in Hornell. 
proud to be serving you. Hi, Saver. Walgreens here. We like the way you save. Take coffee. You know it doesn't have to cost $4 a cup, so you make your own. And co-pays on Medicare Part D. You save up to $5 and get 100 balance rewards points on each prescription when Walgreens is your preferred pharmacy. Save smartly on Med D. Walgreens, trusted since 1901. Copay savings on Tier 1 generic drugs available through select plans that include Walgreens as a preferred pharmacy. Points cannot be earned in Arkansas, New Jersey, or New York. Complete details at walgreens.com slash balance. Let's say you just bought a house. Bad news is, you're one step closer to becoming your parents. Soon you'll have a separate fridge in the basement, where extra groceries are exiled, forever. Remember that frozen lasagna? Of course you don't. It's been down there since 2008. Good news is, it's easy to bundle home and auto through Progressive and save on your car insurance. Piece of cake. Behind the lasagna. It's very old. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company affiliates and other insurers. Discount not available in all states or situations. Hey, Joel and Michael Pernup calling from Watkins Gun International. The most historic racetrack in the world with Joel Orion and 92-1 the team. Welcome back, everybody. Want to uh, shift gears here just a little bit. We've been talking a lot of NFL on the show with the Buffalo Bills and free agency and the draft, but want to get another voice on from the NASCAR world. He is an announcer with the Motor Racing Network. He's a great guy, great follow on Twitter. I've had a chance to interview him several times. It's Jeff Striegel. Jeff, thanks so much for coming on. How are you? I'm good. Joel, it is good to be with you guys again at a very, very difficult time for everybody, isn't it? It certainly is, and Sting was very prolific when he said, don't stand so close to me because you can't stand within 6 to 10 feet of anybody with this COVID-19. And we've dealt with a lot of tragedy in this country, Jeff, and a lot of illnesses, but this COVID-19, it felt like it just kind of caught us off guard and it overwhelmed us very quickly. You know, I don't think anybody could see it coming the way that it has taken over the United States, the way it's taken over the world, the way it's taken over your own state right there in New York. I live in Michigan. Uh, you know, I, I hate the rankings, you know, New York being number one. I think Michigan right now is ranked four or five when it comes to the number of folks that are infected by the virus. Obviously, you guys are number one, and, and obviously anybody that's listening, uh, my heart goes out, especially to anybody who might be affected or know somebody who is affected. Um, and, you know, and, and isn't it, it's one of these situations where, you know, we just don't know when it's going to end. We don't know what tomorrow is going to bring. Every day is something completely different. And, and I've always been a fan of the phrase, tomorrow will get better. No matter what the situation is, tomorrow is going to be better than today. I've always been a, I've always been an advocate of that, and I live by that. In this particular case, I'm not sure that that, that phrase uh, means a lot. And, and I don't think it's accurate because I don't think that we're to the point yet where we know that we can see the light at the end of the tunnel. I think there's a lot of great unknowns. And you, know, you were talking um, a lot about the NFL uh, earlier than you were talking about how other sports have been affected. And of course, we understand that the nation is affected. So, you know, we want to preface it in that fashion. We know there are bigger things going on in this world right now than sports, but it certainly has grinded everything to a halt. And then you kind of segue it into NASCAR, and, and that's that's how I make my living. And a lot of uh, your fans are fans of NASCAR, and, and all we can do right now is just literally sit and wait and try to stay safe. Well, I appreciate those sentiments, Jeff. We do love being number one here in New York, but certainly not in that category. And I think sometimes we live in an egotistical and a very – self-indulgent society, right? If it doesn't affect us or our family or our friends, we don't give it much time or much thought. Michiganders went through a tough time a couple of years ago with the Flint, Michigan water situation. While that was a national story, I don't know how much people on the coast really paid attention to it unless they had family there or they were going to travel there. And that was, that, that was a horrible situation and still ongoing for some people in Flint, Michigan. But I think Part of the reason people are getting so antsy and having cabin fever is one of our distractions, one of our loves is gone as well, right? And that is sports. So we can't go and watch sports. We can't stay home and watch sports or at least new sports, right? We can watch classic sports. But, you know, we can't watch our favorite team or our favorite player or our favorite NASCAR driver. And in my opinion, sports is the great, in my opinion, sports is the greatest reality. In my opinion, sports is the greatest reality show in TV history. And it just allows us to escape 
and have a distraction just for a couple hours from the stressors in our life. And now we don't have that. So I just feel like it's compounding the anxiety and the angst right now in our society with no with no sports and dealing with this virus that we just can't see. It's like an invisible opponent. Well, I agree with you 100%. Um, you know, when you think of the tragedies that happened at the Boston Marathon, how did how did the folks there rally and and, and, and come together? They did it at a, at a uh, Red Sox game. And I can't speak like you can to 9-11 in your home state, but I know that people rallied around the New York Yankees and the New York Mets and their sports teams and their and the people that I think what you said there the greatest reality show is sports and, and you're so right with that because you know I don't care who you are you you have a favorite sports team or uh, something that you can support I, I guess what I'm trying to say is you can have a bad day at work right we've all had it but we knew that when we got home that our favorite college team is going to be playing, our favorite pro team is going to be playing. Maybe we were going to the game. And we, to your point again, those three hours made everything else tolerable. And right now we don't have that. We can't rely on, you know, you were just talking about the Buffalo Bills. We can't rely on the fact that the Bills are going to be playing on Sunday or even, for that matter, the Yankees or the Mets or the Knicks or anybody else in this state. We can't right now uh, determine whether or not that weekend that we have planned at Watkins Glen is going to happen the way that we've been doing it for years. And I know that a number of your loyal listeners are big-time NASCAR fans. We see them at the track. And we know that, that that weekend is sacred to them. The opportunity to go to Watkins Glen to put the camper up, bring the family. Maybe it's a guy's uh, weekend. Maybe it's a, woman, a ladies' weekend. But maybe it's a family weekend. And right now, all of that is up in the air, and nobody can actually make a determination as to what we're going to do next August, let alone what we're going to even be able to do tomorrow. So you guys got four races in, correct? You, you, that was how many you completed right. this season? Yeah, we went to uh, Daytona, then to Las Vegas, then to California, then to Phoenix, and that is where we have stopped at the moment. I forget where the next race was. Was it Atlanta? When did you find out that ra- race wasn't going to happen? Atlanta. Yeah. Uh, you're exactly right. We completed Phoenix. And, and I think that this speaks to just how quickly it took us all. Um, it took you all in New York immediately. All, one day we weren't talking about it. The next day we had a tragedy, right? Mm-hmm. And I think that that was when, you know, when we were in Phoenix, we were talking about it. I remember, you know, we said, boy, this, you know, this could, this could get ugly. I mean, this could get serious. And by the time we were ready to go in Atlanta, we were shut down. Yeah. So, I mean, it happened in a matter of taking a red eye home from Phoenix and getting ready to go on to Atlanta, and we were done. Yeah. So, you know, right now Atlanta has been postponed. Texas has been postponed. Um, we postponed Homestead, Miami, and quite honestly, um, I'm not, you know, I'm, at that point I kind of stopped keeping track of what's been postponed right. in anticipation of what we will do once we get a green light, uh, no pun intended, and we can get back to, to racing and get back to business. As you mentioned, um, Jeff, uh, on the phone with us, Jeff Striegel, announcer for MRN, the Motor Racing Network, does a great job. They uh, do a great job uh, with the broadcast. You can check them out online, MRN.com. It, it did happen so quickly, Jeff. We, were, we, uh, we have a couple local teams on the basketball side of things at the high school level that had made it to the state playoffs. It was at the quarterfinal yeah. level of the state playoffs. And at first it was these games were going to be done uh, without fans, which seemed weird in itself. And then within probably hours, Hours, that decision was thrown away, and it was, you know, the games weren't going to happen. And your hearts go out to the, you know, to the seniors of Voca, made it to the uh, state playoffs for the first time in 30 years. It was a senior-laden team. Now, in the big scheme of things, you know, okay, you don't get to play a basketball game. But those kids will remember that uh, for the rest of their life. Same thing with the college players. I know they're trying to waive yeah. some things at the college level so that uh, these seniors, uh, at least for the spring sport, will get some eligibility. 
I don't know about the winter sports. They're still trying to uh, figure that out. But uh, right down to the to the grassroots, all the way up to the national stuff, uh, has been affected. Now, uh, you guys are trying to. I'm I'm sure you guys are still doing some content on MRN.com with with the shows, and I know you guys are providing some classic races and everything as well with MRN. Correct? Yeah, we are. Um, you know, here's here's a thought. There's a lot of people listening to us right now that probably can take NASCAR way, way back, whether it be the 60s, maybe the 70s, maybe the 80s. But I will tell you this, um, no matter whether you're a brand-new fan or a long-time fan, listening to Barney Hall call in uh, a classic race in NASCAR is not a bad way to spend a Sunday. Is it, is it live and is it happening right now and it, does it contain the, uh, the, uh, the stars of our sport today? No. But it does contain uh, some classic races. I know I was listening to the 2004 Homestead Miami race, and it's just cool. Joel, it's right. just fun. <laughs> no, it's not real. It's we already know who's going to win. We already know what's going to happen. But it's not a bad opportunity to take a trip down memory lane in Barney Hall, the Hall of Fame legendary broadcaster for the Motor Racing Network. Is is you know the main voice. Yep. And so, yes, uh, we have a lot of contents all available to you at MRN.com. Yes, we are giving stations like you the opportunity to air the classic races uh, and some of the content that we continue to create. But that's exactly what we're having to do right now, at least in in the short term, is to create some content just to give you guys something different to play other than, you know, what we're hearing on the news literally every minute after minute after minute. So... You know, I was going to mention something, if you don't mind, Joel. I think what you brought up a minute ago bears repeating, and I really appreciate the fact that you talked about high schools and the fact that they are out prematurely and the student-athletes that play. I hate it for them, I think, more than anybody else, them and the college athletes that were seniors, to your point, you know, when you think of a guy like Kevin Harvick, and, and we all want to go and cheer for Kevin at Watkins Glen or at Bristol or wherever, Kevin's a paid athlete, and he's well paid. And we're going to see him play again. We may not see uh, little Tommy or little Susie play again because they were high school athletes, and their career as being a volleyball player or a basketball player has probably come to an end for, what, 99% of these kids. Mm-hmm. And I hate that, I think, more than anybody, is they're having that taken from them. Some of these, and to your point, Joel, and, and I'm sorry that I'm getting off the NASCAR thing, but you know, some of these kids were going to be um, all-state athletes, or maybe they were going to play in their very first and only and last game as, as, you, as the coach puts the seniors in, and they get stripped of that opportunity. I hate that for everybody. Good team, bad team, going to go to state. Maybe they weren't going to win a game, but unfortunately now we'll never know because we had to bring the sports to an end. So just a side note, Joel, I, I, I'm sorry that I digressed on that, but it's something that we see here in Michigan, you see in New York, we see it all over the country. We will get our pro sports back. Right. The Yankees will take the field at some point. We will race at Watkins Glen at some point, but for a number of athletes, the opportunity has probably come and gone. Let me ask you, you mentioned the races. I'm, I'm going to guess if this goes too long, you can't make races up and the schedule will just be dropped and you'll pick up as wherever we are, correct? Well, that's the great unknown. I think I'm going to offer this to uh, the folks listening that are thinking, okay, we, we want to go to Watkins Glen, we want to go to Pocono, we want to go, we're going to, you know, we're going to travel, we want to go to Michigan this year. Um, what I would suggest is to stay fluid. Uh, don't book anything necessarily right now. Certainly don't. You don't need to book hotels. You don't need to book flights. You don't need to do that type of thing. Stay in close contact with the folks at Watkins Glen. Michael Printup over there and his team are, are right on the ball right now trying to make sure that they communicate with anybody and everybody that may be wanting to go there. Same thing at Pocono, same thing at Michigan. But my point would be this. I would imagine that NASCAR has, right now, Joel, probably 10 to 15 versions of a schedule. And every time that we have to miss a weekend, we throw one version away and move to the next version. 
meaning that we may, as an example now, this is an example, we could conceivably go to Kentucky for a weekend, shoot over to Bristol, run there on Wednesday night, and then head over to Watkins Glen that following Sunday. Right. Before we go maybe to Michigan to run on a Wednesday and that's probably a bad example because we don't have lights in Michigan. Or maybe we go to Richmond on Wednesday, then we come to Michigan to run a double header. Right. Now if you add those up, Joel, that's three, four, five, six, seven races in a matter of, you know, fourteen days. Right. That is what they're faced with. Okay. Now NASCAR has basically stated right. we're going to do everything we can to run thirty six races. I think that's a great idea. That's a great goal to have. Mm-hmm. Every week that we have to cancel makes it more and more difficult to do that. But I think NASCAR Joel is committed to trying to race every single race. Obviously, we know it will not be on necessarily the date that was posted when NASCAR right. cut their schedule. Right. Right. So we have to be fluid. We have to be ready to, to adjust when they finally make a decision. So I suppose you guys could always push it back, especially because you could move some of the races, if you wanted to go into November, December, January, down south or to the west coast as well, correct? I'm glad you're not making the schedule, Joel. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I'm kidding you only in the fact that, yes, our schedule is long enough, and now you've got us <laughs> racing in Phoenix in, you know, on January the 15th, um, knowing that we've got to go back to Daytona for the 500 in True. February. I appreciate that, Joel. Thank you. Um, I'm not going to pass that along to my friends you know, that, that make the schedule that Joel thinks we should be racing in. You know, but, I, but you could be right. Uh, that's that's the great unknown, um, you know, for all of us. We don't know when that first baseball game is going to be or when the World Series is going to be, for that matter. We know it's scheduled. We know that the, the championship race is scheduled right now. I think it's the second week, uh, first weekend, second weekend, first weekend in Phoenix, mm-hmm. or first weekend in November at Phoenix. We know that it's there, right. but is it realistic right now? I don't know. Right. Um, I know that we're scheduled to race in June and August at Michigan. Do I think we're going to do that? You know, if somebody said, do you think we're going to race at Michigan in June? I'd say no, I don't. Um, I really don't. I think that NASCAR might look at that and create a doubleheader just like we're going to see at Pocono. I think that, that that's probably real life. Right. Um, do I think that we're going to race at Richmond on a Saturday night? No, I think we're going to race at Richmond on a Wednesday night, to be honest with you. Yep. But those are my opinions, my mm-hmm. opinions only. Yep. Um, and to put a cap on what you said, certainly it is very possible that the NASCAR season championship race that is currently scheduled at Phoenix could be pushed back, to your point, into December or even later, if NASCAR decides that that's what they need to do to be best for the sport. I do think that what we're going to see is um, if we run a schedule like we are just talking about where you're running a weekend and then you're running a midweek and then you're going back to work that following weekend and maybe another uh, midweek show, Mm -hmm. that is really, really going to tax these teams because they just don't have the kind of cars and, you know, they're going to be literally running transporters from one, track to the next trying to shuffle cars and people from one location to another but i know that everybody honestly everybody is committed to trying to get this done just as soon as we get the opportunity to do so with nascar i mean you guys already had started obviously you have to work on a car for each track but do you think nascar will be able to fire up fairly quickly without missing a beat because it's not necessarily as much of a team sport as these other ones that have been put on hold well, yes and no. I mean, I, I absolutely understand what you're saying, but let, let's take Stuart Haas Rinkle. Uh, they have four drivers led by Kevin Harvick, okay? So we understand that. They have four cars. They have 600 employees, 600 wow. people that support those four cars. Right. That's amazing, right? So you got mm-hmm. four transporters that are on the road four teams that go with those four drivers when they head off to Watkins Glen. 
the amount of work going on behind the scenes at the shop is monumental. Right. In car preparation, engineering, et cetera, people booking flights and hotels, just like what we might do if we're getting ready to go to Daytona for Speed Weeks in 2021, right? So yep. there's a number of people that have to, to uh, be working and all synchronized to make it work. The good thing here for NASCAR is that we were already underway. So cars have already been built. They are ready to go. Kevin Harvick, using him as the example, he is ready to go. His crew, undoubtedly, working out daily, whether that be at the shop or at their house, but those guys that go over the wall and change tires and put fuel in the car, uh, those guys are ripped, they're in shape, and I can assure you that they are practicing and they're ready to go. Right. So I do think that NASCAR, if we got the green light, just all of a sudden got the green light today uh, being Saturday, um, I think we'd probably go to work the following weekend. I think we'd go to work next weekend, Joel, yep. uh, if we could. I don't think that we are going to be in any kind of a position to say, all right, we've got the green light, we're ready to go, let's plan on, uh, let's plan on three weeks so next Sunday. That's not going to happen. When we get the opportunity to go back to work, put cars back on the track, it will be, in my opinion, absolutely within 10 days or less. And I would say it will be the following weekend, given everything is, everything is perfect. And, we, and when we say that, we're talking about within the country. Mm-hmm. So, I don't know. I, I think we're ready to go once we get the opportunity. What's interesting to me right now is so some of these leagues and some of the owners, right, have to make a decision. And I'm not really concerned about the players. Most of these players have, you know, so much money it's good for a couple generations at this point. I'm talking about the office staff, the secretary, uh, the, the, the people that, uh, you know, do the work behind the scenes. So, some of the baseball uh, guys got together and said, we're going we're gonna to pay the people that work at the stadium. And the the beer vendor and the peanut vendor, which I think is, you know, is great. I mean, I, I think they should anyways, because they, I mean, the amount of money that at the NFL and baseball get just off of their TV contract would make people's heads uh, swim. So I think that's a nice, you know, step. I'm not going to necessarily go overboard, but there are, I have heard some organizations like the Boston Bruins, Jeremy Jacobson, who is very stingy, uh, is laying people off and not paying uh, his office staff. So that's a, you know, th- that's totally his job. Choice. Uh, he can do that. That's his team. He owns the garden. He can lay the people off at the Boston Garden uh, if he wants. I think it's a bad move on his part, but he's a businessman, and I guess that's how he got so much money. NASCAR is going to have to make some decisions, I suppose, as an organization. Is and it to your point, you know, Gibbs. Penske, Stewart, those guys have a lot of employees. It's not just the NASCAR drivers. It's not just necessarily the pit crew. I wonder as this goes on, will there be some tough decisions that not only NASCAR but the individual teams and owners will have to make, Jeff? 100% correct. It's uh, There's no other way to get around it, is there? No. Um, Team Penske employs 450 people to work on those three Fords. I gave you the example of Stuart Haas racing 600. When there's no income, when you're, when you're not out there advertising Bush beer, Kevin Harvick using them again as an example, um, you know, everything has to come to a stop. I am aware of, um, you know, some cutbacks that teams have made. My hope uh, is that every team that we saw in Daytona in February, is back with us when we go back on the road whenever that day is. He's going to look at, you know, I'm guessing Joe Gibbs is going to survive. Um, Will every single employee that he had be back when we go back? I don't know. I hope so. I'm guessing maybe not. But when you start looking at some of the teams that, you know, don't have the household names, the smaller teams, the back markers, if you will, I'm not, you know, we got to just hope and pray that those teams can actually survive this. Just like the, the small business that's downtown in Watkins Glen, the cafe, the family-owned business. And I'm going to give you a thought here, and I know that we, I wish we could go all day. I appreciate being on with you, Joel. What I want people to think about, race fans in general, or sports fans, is the businesses, the, the, the short track in New York that you go to every Saturday night that right now is closed. 
Um, just like the cafe downtown, it's family owned, it's closed. Those people are struggling right now. Everybody knows that. The people that work for them right now are not working. I, I look at some of these short tracks and I'm concerned because this is their time. This is when people are knocking down the back gate to get in and buy a hot dog and a beer and a pop and uh, popcorn, go sit in the grandstands, and they pay their $12 to go watch their hometown hero race. Well, that hometown hero has to, number one, be able to afford to even put his car back on the track once we get an opportunity to do that. And the other thing that we have to keep in mind is these short tracks are family-owned, and they probably got a mortgage that's going to come due uh, every month and whether or not they can keep their head above water right now in these difficult times. So I, I just encourage everybody when we finally get that opportunity in New York and everywhere else to go back and, and do things. I'd be looking at some of these places that we used to take for granted. They're going to need some support. They're going to need everybody possible showing up at their back gate, whether it's the local baseball team, the, the short track or whatever, Joel, because I just, I, I'm concerned that some of these folks are just not going to make it. So there's thoughts that maybe what they want to do at some point would be take over a town, a college town, a college that uh, campus that is empty, right, and, and repurpose it almost as an Olympic village and make a sports bubble. Bring these teams in, and they play right there, you know, no fans. And that sounds like a great idea, but when you think about it, Jeff, one, everybody's got to be quarantined for two weeks, right? Then it's, it's not just five-on-five five basketball, right? I mean, you gotta, you got to have the whole team. Then you got coaching staffs, right? Then you got the, um, then you got the, uh, uh, the, the the doctors and the trainers. If you're going to broadcast it on TV, you got the announcers and the engineers. Um, it just it would be. I, I guess it could be done, but it would be a huge undertaking because again, it's not like well, let's just race NASCAR. They're in a car by themselves, right? They're not going to give it to each other. But it, it's so much more. I just don't. It sounds great. Let's just make a big Olympic village, and these teams will just play each other right there. But I just don't know if that can be pulled off. And if one person gets it, right, if somebody comes in and they don't know they have it, it's going to spread like wildfire, and they're all going to have to be quarantined in this bubble for a long time. I have uh, an easy answer for that, and I'm <laughs> going to um, steal the phrase that your governor, Governor Como, has been preaching for the last three or four weeks, stay home, stay safe, yep. and we'll come back when this virus is, when, when we all believe that we can, yep. when it's under control, or we've killed it, or whatever words we want to use. Yep. But I, I, we had people, Joel, we had people going, why aren't you going to Atlanta? Right. Why are we not racing in Atlanta? <laughs> Just race there without the right. fans. Yep. Really? Really? <laughs> Stop and think of what that means now, and we're talking, you know, I'm talking to, to people here in New York. New York people get it. Yep. Um, apparently at that time, people around the country didn't get it, mm -hmm. because to your point, we still have to have guys driving trucks. We have to have guys that unload the trucks. We have to have uh, broadcasters. We have to have NASCAR officials. We have to have hundreds of people go to the track. You know, mix with one another. I don't care how far you try to stay away from somebody. That's not going to work. And wouldn't that be just what NASCAR needs right now is to say, you know, NASCAR tried to run the event Atlanta, the event, the event at Atlanta, and guess what? Six of their people now have been tested positive with the coronavirus. Yep. That would have been just great, right? Yep. That's what everybody needs. That's the last thing anybody needs. We don't need the, uh, the Knicks to play. Uh, and find out that, you know, just like why they canceled, just exactly why we canceled it was when we found out that one member of the NBA had tested positive, boom, we're done. That was it. And that was the right call. Yep. Um, I don't want to see anybody assembling for any reason. Yep. There's just no reason to. Every time we do it, Mardi Gras or something else, I mean, just put 10 people together for crying out loud, we take the chance yep. of extending this. And I think that the more we continue to disobey on what you know, what folks like Governor Como and, and uh, the administration have asked us to do, the longer this is going to go. If we can all just buckle down, it, it's it, it's awful. Yep. We all know that. Um, but if we can endure, hopefully, and who knows? I mean, we just say it this way: if we can endure another thirty days, 
maybe, just maybe, we can get life back to normal. Yeah. But um, So, there you go. Hey, Long I'm answer, I know, but no, I'm not for it at all. Here's the problem. is Some people are staying home. Some people are not. And the problem is, the more people that just try to put their head down and fight through this because they can't afford to stay home, it's only going to last longer. So, it can suck for six months. Or it can suck for eighteen months. That's that's which one would you rather have? That that's what I try to say, right? I mean, if if we can get through this in six months, it's going to be way better than two years. So the more people that just say, "Okay, I'm going to stop doing what I'm doing and put life on hold," I think the faster, Jeff, we're going to get through all this. Well, I agree with you, Joel. And I mean, I, and I do believe, and I know you do too, that we will get through this. There will be a day when uh, everything is lifted and people are invited to go back to work, and they're invited to go uh, and hang out with their friends, and they're invited to go to their local short track on a Saturday night, and Watkins Glen is up and running, and you know exactly when that date is going to be, and, and you can start making your plans and get the camper ready and get the family ready. But right now, the only thing that we can do is to do it wrong and prolong it. And if we do it right, hopefully that day comes a whole lot sooner than... Um, been like you said, been six months or eighteen months down the line. So it's a difficult time. Yeah, um, I, I love the opportunity to talk to sports and Joel or talk about sports. But Joel, I'll tell you, I, I appreciate how you put sports in perspective uh, for what's going on in the world today. Uh, it's not just about who signed quarterback and who really? didn't. I care. I do. I, I care about my Detroit Lions. Um, I don't care about your Buffalo Bills or your New York Jets, for that matter. I care about my Detroit Lions. But, uh, and I'm, I'm kidding only. Uh, and, and you know what? If it wasn't for some of that stuff that we can read and, and listen to, people are agreeing with us right now or they're disagreeing, and we're creating at least somebody thinking about something other than, you know, what's attracting everybody's attention right now. I posted a picture on my Facebook page. It was the picture of the comfort, and I'm sure you've seen it by now. It wasn't my picture. I stole it. I'll be the first <laughs> one to look at it. It was the, the comfort that was coming by the Statue of Liberty and the, and the, sky, the uh, skyline of New York City was in the background. Absolutely. And I said, one picture that captures 2020. That's all I put on there. Because I think that that picture, you could show every single person in America that one picture and go, what does this signify? And every single person would be able to tell you. That's crazy, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Um, you know, it goes back to 9-11. We all know that picture. We all have it in our head. You could show that picture to anybody. They all know what that picture represents. Right. And now here we are in 2020, trying to live our life day to day, and that one picture represents to me, and I think to every single American around the country, exactly what we're going through at this difficult time. Well, but we'll it, get through it. Well, that's a great antidote and story, and it goes back to that old saying, right? A picture says a thousand words. Well, that's a great example of it. Jeff, thanks so much for coming on. From mine to yours, stay safe, stay healthy, and hopefully we'll talk here soon, maybe when uh, NASCAR comes to Watkins Glen or it gets fired back up. You bet, Joel. And I was just going to say, why don't we do this? Why don't we just plan it? When we know for sure when Watkins Glen is going to happen, let's revisit with one another. And we won't talk about this that we're dealing with today. We'll talk about who's going to be the favorite going in to Watkins Glen. I enjoy it, Joel. I really appreciate being on with you and you as well. Stay safe. All right. There you go. Jeff Striegel, announcer for the Motor Racing Network. Let's take a break. It's 92 on the team. For now, I'm the only one allowed to visit the artisan residence at Walker Metalsmiths. Let's see what he's up to. What you doing? Making a diamond engagement ring. So I see it as a cathedral sort of design with... Hush, not on the radio. It might be a surprise. You never know who's listening. Right. Uh, You have made a lot of wedding and engagement rings. Which was your favorite? Remember that couple from the festival in Fairport? That could be a lot of people. Three years in a row, they came in during Canal Days Festival and shopped for a ring, but insisted they were not getting engaged or married. They dithered for three years before you showed them that awesome purple sapphire. Both of their faces lit right up, and I knew it was going to be theirs. I remember when they came in to pick it up. He made her wait outside. He brought it out to her and proposed right on the steps of Walker Metalsmiths. It was great. The ring is nice, too. I think Steve likes telling stories just as much as he loves making jewelry. 
I miss seeing our customers, but you can still connect on Facebook, Instagram, and through our website, walkerscelticjewelry.com. Mullen Factory Direct Floor Covering has been serving this area for many years. During life's ups and downs, we've never quite experienced anything like this. There's no official day or time set for us all to go back to business as usual, but Mullins wants you to know they're there for you and your flooring projects. And it's also a good time to say thanks to all the loyal customers and remind you to support all area local small businesses to help them stay afloat during this unprecedented time. Be safe and stay healthy from your friends at Mullen Factory Direct Floor Covering in Almond. 92.1 92.1 The Team WCKR Cornell This station presents Real American Heroes Real American Heroes Today, we salute you, Mr. Incredibly Mean Easter Egg Hider. Mr. Incredibly Mean Easter Egg Hider. Easter egg hunts are fun times for small children. Children who joyfully run around and collect colorful eggs. But for you, it's a competition. A competition you intend to win. Great job, you fool the five-year-old. What kind of monster hides eggs and dog do? One that's going straight to hell. So whether you're comforting a crying, empty basket-holding toddler or taking a boy to the ER after he fell out of a tree grabbing a plastic egg, be sure to give a piece of your mind to Mr. Incredibly Mean Easter Egg Hider, a real American hero. Mr. Incredibly Mean Easter Egg Hider. I suppose next year you're going to hide the invisible eggs. Nice. It's the Joel Orion Show. Listen, this is what we do. 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, 365 days a year. On 92.1 The Team. Hey, yeah, I was never uh, much a fan of Because <laughs> uh, I'm very competitive, and, and um, being uh, legally blind, uh, finding plastic eggs in an Easter egg hunt was never at the uh, at the top of my list. My sister used to... to me at that all the time and like you know rub it in my face i'm like oh, congratulations you found more plastic eggs uh than a, you know somebody who can't see uh, you, you should be real bright you should i would hope <laughs> be able to find uh, tanner uh, now you do you you don't have any siblings so you did you still do an easter egg hunt when you were little um i think so but you know that was something that probably I grew out of quickly. I can't imagine that I did many of them after the age of five because I can't remember doing any after the age of five. But I'm sure when I was a young <laughs> lad that uh, my parents had me do it at least a couple times. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure you did it some. Obviously, it wasn't a, a, an extreme highlight. I mean, you know, I, we did it for uh, Kale Willie when he was little. Um, and, you know, candy in him. And then eventually, you know, you put money in him because uh, they, they want money and not the candy. And then they eventually, uh, you know, uh, grow out of it. But um, so uh, I mentioned when we went to break there, uh, this Jonathan Bales, um, he uh, was challenged to do 2,400 push-ups in 12 hours now he's a fitness guy and uh he thought he could do it so he wanted to raise some money for charity to go towards uh a um a uh an organization or a or a group that would uh, be able to help people with covid19 so he uh, he started at 11 a.m in the morning and he had to average 3.33 push-ups Per hour uh, to hit his mark to get to the 2400, and um, so he he said it was interesting. So he started with sets of six push-ups each, which continued for hours. He then rotated sets of six with sets of five, eventually tapering off to sets of four for the rest of the duration. Uh, he said, I was going uh, to do higher reps, but everyone I talked to suggested not to do that. After the long break, five hours in, I could have uh, I, I could have finished faster, but I thought I might get injured. I was feeling like I was going to tear my bicep. Uh, his plan, Bale said, uh, he never wanted to have more than six reps uh, at a time and never have more than 45 seconds of rest in between reps. 
I plan to finish in nine hours with some wiggle room in case I couldn't keep up that pace, which is obviously what happened because he went um, uh, 11 hours and five minutes. That's still not too bad, Tanner. 2,400 push-ups at, uh, in 11 hours and five minutes minutes that's and and so he did win the bet and he got the two thousand dollars and he did say he's going to donate that to charity so a good cause there's someone who's social distancing and staying isolated but raised some money on twitch uh for a good cause that's about uh, 2400 push-ups more than i would have done in that 11 hours so props to him <laughs> um, so I have this. Um, so I have this book. Now we talked about the um, uh, the jelly bean challenge, the Ronald Reagan jelly bean challenge. How many jelly beans you can get in your mouth um, while still saying Mr. Gorbachev tear down that wall? So I have another book. Um, it's the record setter book of world records so i was just flipping through it some of these uh are interesting that me we might be able to do uh some of these are you know you can do while you're self-quarantined um most potatoes held in your hand at once most uh cheeses named in 10 seconds uh most ketchup packets squeezed open in 30 seconds most questions asked during a single drive through visit. Any guesses on what the record for that is, Tanner? Uh, 50? I'm just taking a complete shot in the dark there. <laughs> 33. Oh. That's, that's a it's lot of questions. not too bad. That's a, <laughs> I'd hate, yeah, I'd hate to be behind that person uh, in line. Uh, l- largest soda can pyramid. Um, well, you can't do that one while social distancing. I'll jump over that one. Longest straw used to drink a Coca-Cola. 56 feet. That is a long straw. Um, most type of beverages consumed in 30 seconds. 12. Wow, that's a lot. Um, let's see. Most items read off a Chinese takeout menu in one minute. Most pizza slice face slaps in 15 seconds. I think you could break a lot of these, Tanner. Um, I, hey, we have a pizza sitting up on the stove right now, so theoretically <laughs> we could do that one, but I'm not really down to do that one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, how about this one? Fastest time to open a can of alphabet soup <laughs> and spell pantyhose. <laughs> <laughs> the, the record, one minute and 25 seconds. Uh, you know what? That's another one that uh, if only we had alphabet soup around here, I'd be willing to give that one a try. <laughs> I'm interested how that works. Are you just allowed to reach in and just pick out the letters you need? That's, uh, I'm intrigued by that one. Um, greatest height to drop a hot dog into a hot dog bun. I mean, boy, I, I'm impressed on who came up with all these. Um Fastest time to drink a two-ounce bottle of Tabasco sauce through a coffee stir. Oh, my. <laughs> That's interesting. Um, fastest time to open a bag of Skittles and sort them by color. Oh, I look... Beast mode, uh, that, Marshawn Lynch would like that. He that, loves that, Skittles. You know, that Boy, sounds they just like go on and on. There is a ton of them. That sounds like something I'd love to try because my favorite candy is Skittles, but I know I wouldn't be able to do that because I would eat at least a few of them before I got them color-coded and everything. 21.9 seconds, Tanner, you, got, you would have to do that in. Oh, I could eat the whole bag in 21.9 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> No, you just have to sort them by color, though. You don't have to eat them. How about this one? Most birthday candles fit on a cupcake and lit. That... 235. Wow. Man, that must be a big cupcake. 235. <laughs> Most donut holes stuffed into donuts in 15 seconds. I, who comes up with these? Holy moly. These are some odd, odd ones. Um, and then let's see. Most fortune cookies eaten and read aloud in one in one minute. So I have a book of uh, a whole lot of them that we can uh, we can go over. Speaking of um, uh, doing some things, uh, I have a book. I don't sure we're going to get Wade on today. Wade Phillips, longtime defensive coordinator and head coach uh, in the NFL. 
Uh, last with the L.A. Rams going to the Super Bowl two years ago when they lost to the New England Patriots. Uh, he has a book. Now, this book came out in uh, 2017 from Diversion Books. It's Son of Bum, Lessons I Learned from My my Dad About Football and Coaching. We have a couple copies to give away. If you would like to win a Wade Phillips book, and I, I've heard it's a, a very good book. I've started reading it. I have the uh, copies here, and the, the copies have been self-quarantined. Um you can uh, the first person to text us and email us they will each get a copy of the book so if you text us at 363 team 363 team and email 921 the team at gmail.com uh, we will give some copies away so that's uh so that's your chance to win we hope to get weighed on if not today uh, then next week we also have dave stone we want to try to get to today from noonsmagician.com there's so much to get to though uh i'm not sure we're going to be able to do it let's um tanner why don't we run down some of the uh great programming coming up on 92 one the team i know it starts i believe today and tomorrow with some because i know a lot of people are bummed out about the Masters. You know, that is probably the most popular golf tournament all year long. Uh, people, you know, even just bandwagon and casual golf fans will tune in for the Masters, at least the last round on Sunday. But uh, why don't we go down the list here, at least for this upcoming week, because I know there's a lot of them here on 92 on the team uh, provided by Westwood One Sports. Uh, why don't we go over some of the uh, upcoming classic games? Yep, 92-1, the team will have you covered. If you're bummed out about uh, missing the Masters, they'll have a couple rewinds. First up is today. They will be replaying the final round from the 2004 Masters from 2 p.m. to 6 p.m. And tomorrow, the final round of the 2019 Masters will be broadcasted from 2 to 6 p.m. And also, you can get your fix of old NFL games this coming week on Monday, April 13th at 8 p.m. Uh, the last Super Bowl between the Kansas City Chiefs and San Francisco 49ers will be rebroadcasted. And Thursday, April 16th at 8 p.m., the 1992 AFC wildcard game, arguably one of the greatest comebacks in postseason history. It's the Houston Oilers and Buffalo Bills. You can catch those all on 92-1 The Team. Yeah, some say that's the greatest comeback of all time. What was it? I think it was was it thirty five to three? I think was the score at halftime with Houston up. That game was at Ralph Wilson Stadium. It was a wild card game. It was a run and shoot offense. Both teams ran, and uh, the you know, and and I won't give the final score, um, but you can certainly Google it. But uh, the Bills came storming back, and if I'm correct, uh, Kelly did not play in that game. That was Frank Wright uh, at quarterback. Uh, and uh, he uh, he engineered that great comeback. It would you know, and it's just kind of cool to go back and listen because at the time you were probably ah you know okay they scored a touchdown and they're never gonna come back and then they scored another one and you know then you got kind of wrapped up in it. It's gonna be kind of cool to be able to go back and kind of listen to how that all unfolded and you know they're gonna win so you know they're gonna come back. And it's kind of interesting to see now, you know, what plays up. You know, I mean, Houston must have went three and out a ton of times uh, in that third quarter. I mean, because when you don't get first downs, the run and shoot turns into the hurry up and punt. And I think that's what happened to Houston was they couldn't get anything going on offense. And um, it was an, an incredible comeback. So that'll be a very cool game uh, for people to uh, listen to. Uh, we are your home for Westwood One Sports in the southern tier also going on and again these are just things that are trying to fill people's time and energy and uh distract them a little bit um there's a fan poll going on for school spirit or or college spirit or the most uh, crazy fan base uh, out there um it's not necessarily sport basketball or football i think it's just for your college okay and which ones have the most rabid, you know, rabid fan base. Now, the only teams that are locally in it are Buffalo. I think they were a 12-seed Tanner, and I think Syracuse was a 4-seed. St. Bonaventure uh, did not make it. Um, so those were the only local ones. Has that begun, and have those teams uh, moved on to the uh, next round? Yes, they're on to the second round. Buffalo was in the East Division, 
and uh, they ended up losing to number five Villanova. But for Syracuse, they were the four seed in the South Division. So there's four divisions here of this bracket. There's the Midwest Division, the West, the East, and the South. Syracuse was in the South Division. I don't know how they determined you know, the divisions, but uh, that's where Syracuse was. And in the first round, they were pitted against 13th seed South Dakota State, and they were able to advance. So the next round, they will be taking on number five, Gonzaga. All right, sounds good. And, uh, where can uh, where, where can people go to vote on this? I think it can be done on Twitter. Just, you know, they post pictures of the bracket whenever it's updated. I'm pretty sure you can just hashtag... Uh, let me see if I can pull it up here. I closed out Twitter accidentally, but you can just hashtag and then uh, vote for uh, the team that you want to advance. Let's see here. Hashtag Fox Fan Vote, and then uh, just put the team name that you want. I think uh, that's how you vote. And there's still plenty of time to vote. They've only gone through two rounds, so there is uh, plenty more to go. So if you want to do that, hashtag FoxFanVote and uh, vote for your college. Now, if I could just say here, you know what, we might be a little bit biased, but I think Syracuse might have a pretty good chance in this thing because they led the nation in attendance this year. Throughout all their home games, they averaged 21,256 people, which was 1,142 more than second place Kentucky, who averaged 20,114. They also won the attendance title last year. They averaged 21,100 and 92 uh, fans in their home games. Their attendance title last year, it was their first since going back-to-back -back in 2014 and 2015. And overall, including this year, this is the 16th time that Syracuse has led the nation in attendance since the opening of the Carrier Dome in 1980. So, like I said, we might be biased, but Syracuse, I mean, they might be the favorites to win this thing. They're up against some stiff competition, but the proof is in the pudding. They've had some uh, very solid attendance throughout the years, and Lord knows that the on-court product wasn't the best thing for them this year, but still, they know how to draw a crowd up there in Syracuse. No doubt about it. We'll take a break. That leads us to our next guest, Dave Stone from Noon's Magician. I mean, it also helps to have the Carrier Dome, which can, you know, fill you know, whatever the capacity of that is, 60,000 or whatever. Um, I do think they're in the Duke region, though, and I, I don't want to see them lose to uh, Duke in this fan bracket. I would hope that... Uh, the Orange Nation can come out and um, support the Orange better than the Dukies. That's for sure. Let's take a break here a little bit early. We'll get Dave Stone on. We'll talk to him about the SU basketball team, the SU football team. Talk about the website noonsmagician.com. And then we'll come back and uh, we'll wrap up the show with a, a couple pieces of uh, show notes and news that uh, we want to get to before we head on out here today. It is 92.1, the team. For now, I'm the only one allowed to visit the artisan residence at Walker Metalsmiths. Let's see what he's up to. What you doing? Making a diamond engagement ring. So I see it as a cathedral sort of design with... Hush, not on the radio. It might be a surprise. You never know who's listening. Right. Uh... You have made a lot of wedding and engagement rings. Which was your favorite? Remember that couple from the festival in Fairport? That could be a lot of people. Three years in a row they came in during Canal Days Festival and shopped for a ring but insisted they were not getting engaged or married. They dithered for three years before you showed them that awesome purple sapphire. Both of their faces lit right up and I knew it was going to be theirs. I remember when they came in to pick it up. He made her wait outside. He brought it out to her and proposed right on the steps of Walker Metalsmiths. It was great. The ring is nice, too. I think Steve likes telling stories just as much as he loves making jewelry. I miss seeing our customers, but you can still connect on Facebook, Instagram, and through our website, walkerscelticjewelry.com. Mullen Factory Direct Floor Covering has been serving this area for many years. During life's ups and downs, we've never quite experienced anything like this. There's no official day or time set for us all to go back to business as usual, but Mullins wants you to know they're there for you and your flooring projects. And it's also a good time to say thanks to all the loyal customers and remind you to support all area local small businesses to help them stay afloat during this unprecedented time. Be safe and stay healthy from your friends at Mullen Factory Direct Floor Covering in Almond. 
Hi, uh, this is David Tyree, former wide receiver for the Syracuse Orangemen, and you are listening to 92 won the team with Joel Orion. Welcome back, everybody. You know that music. It's the fight song of the SU Orange. And we're going to talk a little SU sports, primarily basketball, and one of the best sites to go to for SU sports, whether it be basketball, football, lacrosse, is noonsmagician.com. It's been around for a long time now. The uh, title of the website is Troy Noons is an Absolute Magician. But the uh, domain name is noonsmagician.com. And we've got one of the writers on to talk a little SU basketball. We'll put a uh, period on the end of the SU basketball season. Uh, Let's bring him in. It's Dave Stone. Dave, just for people who may not be familiar or remember who Troy Noons is, why don't you go ahead and just explain real quickly the namesake of the website? Yeah, so, uh, you know, Noons Magician's been around for a while. Uh, It's based off of uh, Troy Noons, who's a former SU quarterback and, uh, in our opinion, one of the more underrated uh, quarterbacks at Syracuse. Um, And, uh, yeah, it kind of became a whole uh, running thing back in the day. Um, you know, I've I've actually only been with New Magician for uh, about a year now, just about. Um, but you know, the site's been around forever, and uh, you know, certainly, certainly we try to have a lot of fun with it, and uh, you know, kind of combine the, a little bit of witty humor with with everything that we do. Dave, I hope you and yours are healthy. I'm guessing you're working from home at this point. You are uh, self distancing from everybody else. Yeah, yeah, completely working from home, uh, just like a lot of the country is at this point. But uh, yeah, uh, safe and sound, and. Uh, you know, uh, enjoying it uh, for for what it is, and uh, you know, definitely uh, a lot more time to to look at stuff regarding Syracuse basketball. Really, kind of dig into the the nitty gritty of it. Now, the site has been around for a long time. Troy Noons must be aware of the site because of its popularity. It's one of the go-to websites for SU sports, and if he wants to follow his alma mater, which he played quarterback for, I'm sure. He has seen it, and if he ever were to Google his own name, <laughs> it's one of the top hits. Does Troy have any affiliation with the website? Uh, you know, that's a that's a great question. Like I said, I've only been here for about a year, so I'm not entirely sure on that front. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I know that uh, yeah, he, he definitely knows that it exists. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, the name may have started out as a goof for a lark, but the website has become a credible source of SU athletic news and information let me uh get your thoughts let's put a bow on the su basketball season wasn't the best season it looked like they were gonna make the nit tournament they had a couple good wins but they had more bad losses than good wins but you followed the team very closely give me your postseason recap and thoughts on this year's season sure sure uh yeah i mean you know it it was definitely up and down uh struggled a lot at the beginning of the year, which, uh, you know, not all expected. You know, we lost our starting point guard, uh, Jalen Carey, to injury in the, uh, you know, after the second game of the season. You know, tough to recover from that. And, uh, you know, just a lot of different uh, moving parts on the team this year. So, um, you know, it was a challenge early in the season, but I think by the end of the year, the team was really starting to gel. Uh, you know, it's too bad that the season was cut short. I mean, obviously it was the right decision, but, uh, you know, after that uh, North Carolina game in the ACC tournament, we were looking pretty darn good. <laughs> yeah, they did seem to get clicking there at the end. Let me get your thoughts. If I had asked you in November that this is kind of where the team would be when the season ended, would you be happy with it? Would you be surprised? Would you be a little disappointed? Where does how the season ended compared to your expectations going in? I mean, you know, as, as, as a Syracuse fan, I don't think you're ever really satisfied if you're not making the NCAA <laughs> tournament. So, a little bit disappointing, but you know, at the same time, with a uh, lot of different, different pieces in there, you know, starting a freshman point guard and and, uh, you know, a center that's been injured the past couple of years in Barama City Bay. Uh, you know, there's, it, it was uh, it's hard to predict this year's team. So um, I wasn't super disappointed, but, uh, you know, it was an interesting year. How many players do you anticipate Syracuse targeting in the transfer portal this year and at what positions? Obviously, Eli Hughes is off to the NBA and a handful of bench players have transferred. So uh, what do you see them doing on that front? 
Yeah, I know we've got uh, we've got our, our name in the ring with a, with a few. Uh, you know, Griffin from Illinois is one that we're in uh, his final six, and uh, I've heard good things about that. Uh, you know, the, that Syracuse is definitely a contender there. Um, you know, I think there's a couple other guys that we're looking at. Um, uh, Carter from New Mexico is one that comes to the top of my mind, and uh, you know, there's a few others out there. So um, I know that we're looking for for someone in that uh, three spot to, to kind of fill in for the, the big shoes that uh, Elijah Hughes had on the team. Um, other than that, I know we've been looking at a couple uh, transfer centers, um, but uh, I'm not sure where we're at with that. So I think the, the big priority is definitely uh, someone that can cover for uh, what Hughes brought for the team last year. Why don't you get your thoughts on the one and dones? Now, we don't have as many at SU as other programs like Kentucky. I know that there's been a couple guys that have jumped to the NBA that really haven't done much, probably might have regretted jumping to the NBA and not staying at the college ranks, haven't quite panned out the way that maybe they had wanted it to. I know Jim has talked about, you know, people coming to him, whether it be the player or their parents and saying, yeah, we kind of regret jumping to the NBA. Your thoughts on the one and dones that SU has had over the last few years or guys that have left early from the program? You know, I mean, for the most part, I really, really don't have an issue with it. I mean, that's just kind of the way that the game has evolved. Um, It's something that, uh, you know, every coach really needs to prepare for at this point, uh, you know, not even just uh, uh, the guys jumping to the NBA, but the transfers. I think there's, what, like 500 names in the portal already. Um, so, you know, that's just, a, that's just a part of the game now. And, uh, you know, especially for guys that are in the program for at least a couple of years, Tyus Battle, Elijah Hughes, who's just contributed so much. You know, how can you be mad at them for, for <laughs> trying to do what's best for their career moving forward? On the phone with us, Dave Stone. He covers Syracuse basketball for the website noonsmagician.com. Now, Dave, you're an SU grad, right? Uh, yes, yep. I graduated from SU in 2004. Uh, I was actually at every home game during the, the championship season and uh, was part of the celebration on Marshall Street there. So uh, it was definitely a very exciting time. Yeah, that must have been pretty awesome to be there for the 03 National Championship. I was there in 98-99. Neither team did real well, the basketball or football team. Basketball-wise, they made it to the Sweet 16 and then got knocked out in the first round in my senior year. Had a couple NBA guys on the team when I was there. Jason Hart, Eton Thomas, Damone Brown. There was some other really good players on the team as well. Todd uh, Bergen. There was also Ryan Blackwell. Alan Griffith was there. Uh, Mario Canulis, who actually graduated from Prattsburg, the school right down the road from us here. So there was a couple good players on the basketball team and then the football team went eight and four and seven and five under Paul Pasqualoni. McNabb was the quarterback at the time my junior year my senior year actually Troy Noons was the starting quarterback for the Orange. Let me get your thoughts on Jim Beheim in his 44th season he's been the head coach of the SU Orange longer than I've been alive or you for that matter as you're younger than me. Five final four appearances under Bayheim's reign at SU. National Championship in 03. He's made it to two Final Four since that National Championship. Went about 10 years after the National Championship without a Final Four appearance. Got there in 2013. He's a four seed, losing to the four seed Michigan in the Final Four. Michigan went on to win the National Championship that year. Then in 2016, they were the Cinderella story as the 10th seed, getting to the Final Four, losing to number one UNC. Just from afar, Dave, it just seems to me that you know Jim might be you know winding down he doesn't necessarily have the fire and the in the fight that maybe he once did you could argue that the recruiting classes aren't as good as they've been in the past although maybe he's you know been a little bit reinvigorated and got a little bit more of a spark with Buddy Beheim playing for him now Give me your thoughts on Jim Beheim. Uh, yeah, no, uh, you know, every time that uh, that I I feel like maybe maybe it's time to move on, you know, he really surprises me. Uh, you know, honestly, I thought he did a a, a good job with uh, with a young team. There's some you know some issues that uh, that I think a lot of us have with just the amount of playing time that some guys get and stuff like that. But uh, you know, you really can't argue with his track record. I mean, you know, he's 
uh, still never had a losing season in 44 years at SU. I mean, how insane is that? I don't think there's another coach out there that you can say that about. So, um, you know, as, as many uh, issues as, as we might have with him, you know, he, he gets the job done and wins. So, uh, you know, you can't fault him too much for that, at least. On the phone with us, Dave Stone. He is a writer and covers SU basketball for the website Noon's Magician. Dave, I want to get your thoughts on two things. One, I grew up with SU playing in the Big East. And back then, I thought it was the roughest, toughest, best conference in America. Georgetown, Providence, St. John's, Rutgers, Boston College, Villanova, Pittsburgh. It was just a brutal conference to play in. UConn was great under Jim Calhoun. Since the Orange have joined the ACC in 2013, they have struggled. They have not eclipsed 30 wins since joining. They've had double-digit losses in every season. They have not finished in the top 25 in any of the seasons since they've joined the ACC. They got their first ACC tournament win this year over UNC, who was having a down year. So maybe the ACC is just deeper from top to bottom than the Big East was and maybe just I was a kid and it just seemed a better conference than it really was and my second question is about Buddy Beheim. I think Buddy would be a star in the A-10 or the Colonial Conference or the Mid-Missouri or the MAC. He gets a little bit more playing time than I think he would on any other ACC team or if his name was Buddy Orion. Give me your thoughts on Buddy Beheim and his playing time under his dad, Jim Beheim. So, um, I mean, I, I do think that uh, the ACC has a lot of great teams. Um, I, I think it's a kind of a combination of a lot of factors. Um, you know, the, the sanctions against the team from uh, the last violations, uh, you know, we're just kind of getting over the effects of that. Uh, recruiting's been down for the past few years a little bit. You know, we haven't landed as many of the uh, top 25, top 50 guys that we used to. Um, you know, and just with uh, with all of the, the guys leaving early and transferring and everything like that, you know, it's tough to, to keep, keep a cohesive unit. So I think that's, uh, that's part of the problem. Um, you know, in terms of Buddy, uh, I really like Buddy. I think that he's a tremendous offensive player. Um, I do think that he sees too many minutes personally. Uh, you know, it's tough. I mean, he's, you know, uh, he was one of the uh, top players uh, in terms of minutes in the entire uh, NCAA. So, you know, it, it's tough because, you know, if you care, compare him to someone like Carmelo Anthony or whatever, they played a very similar amount of minutes, but, you know, the production's a little bit different. So, um, like I said, I love Buddy. I think he's an amazing offensive player. I do wish that he got a little bit more rest um, just so that we could, you know, maybe develop a few uh, guards in the background and, uh, you know, get some, get some depth there. So I've laid out my argument that the Orange have struggled in the ACC since joining in 2013, although they made the Final Four in 13 and 16. However, Mike Hopkins left the program after that Final Four, went to Washington, and I believe he is one of the best recruiters in the nation. So I think, Dave, that might be a big reason why some of the recruiting classes have been down over the last few years. Do you agree? Well, I, I definitely think that's one of the factors. I mean, you know, uh, if you talk to any of the, the recruits in the past, they'll say that Hopkins was a, was a big factor in why they came to SU, and he's incredibly well-respected on the recruiting trail. Um, and you got to figure he had great ties with a lot of guys in the Northeast. You know, several of the recruits that he's gotten to Washington in the last couple of years were, uh, were guys that were heavily recruited at Syracuse. Yeah. So uh, it absolutely is a factor. I think there's other things uh, as well. But, uh, I mean, you know, Hopkins is a tremendous coach. He's been... You know, he won uh, the Pac-10 Coach of the Year uh, twice in a row. So, I mean, like, he's, he's certainly doing well. Well, speaking of how long Jim Beheim is going to be there, who do you think will succeed him as the head coach? Now, I know he hasn't said when he'll retire, but it's really not out of the question to think it'll be in, you know, the next two to three years. So with that said, who do you think will succeed Jim Beheim as the next head coach? Um, you know, I think there's there's a few different ways they could go with it. Um, I know they'll look internally. Uh, you know, Jim uh, has a lot of respect for his assistants and, uh, you know, is probably one of the most loyal guys in all of NCAA basketball. So you know that uh, he's definitely going to want them to at least look internally at that or, uh, you know, something like that. But, uh, you know, there's there, I think there's a, a bunch of big-name coaches that are going to become available over the next few years. And uh, I fully expect uh, Wild Hack to go 
full board and look for the, the absolute best. And, you know, if that is someone internal, great. But, uh, you know, there's, there's going to be a bunch of big names that uh, come up over the next couple of years. And I know we'll, we'll have our, uh, our name in the ring for them. So I saw a fun story on NoonsMagician.com that the ACC men's basketball official Twitter was holding a fans vote for the greatest ACC player of all time. And the SU fans... Orange Nation took over. Dave, I don't think the ACC expected that to happen, my friend. Uh, yeah, I'm pretty <laughs> sure that we had the, all of the Final Four players, which is, uh, which is pretty, pretty fun. Uh, you know, it's, uh, it's always fun to, to see the SU fans come out in full force and, and really show that we have uh, the greatest fan base in all college basketball, in my opinion. Yes, you're correct. So the Final Four was Billy Owens versus D.C. Derek Coleman, and then Dwayne the Pearl Washington against Carmelo Anthony. And Mello won the championship 79 to 21 for Derek Coleman. Keep in mind that none of them, Dave, came even close to playing in the ACC. Nope, not a one of them. So, uh, yeah, they, they definitely, uh, definitely didn't necessarily think that through. I think uh, it might have made a lot more sense for them to just discount any of uh, the non-ACC schools. But uh, definitely an interesting uh, perspective there. Was there any SU player that you would have liked to see make the tournament that didn't. Well, I mean, that's that's the thing with SU. Uh, you know, we have quite a, an impressive Mount Rushmore up there of uh, of the best players. So it's uh, you you can make a case for a whole bunch of different guys. Um, you know, Sherman Douglas was pretty amazing. Uh, Lawrence Moten back in the day. John Wallace. I mean, uh, those were some. You know, Wallace made it to uh, the NCAA uh, finals, and the only reason we probably didn't win there is because we went up against a pretty impressive Kentucky team. So right. you know, there's there's a lot of a lot of guys that could make that list. I think so. I, you know, I think I, I, I thought they did a good job with, with who they did pick. But again, you know, they didn't really play in the ACC. So, uh, <laughs> inter- interesting way to go about it for sure. Noonsmagician.com, great website for SU fans, for basketball, football, great information and news and content on the phone with us. Dave Stone, and he is a writer for Noonsmagician.com, and he covers the basketball team. You've been pretty lucky, Dave, covering the basketball team. They've been more successful than. In the football team over the past several years. <laughs> uh, that, that is true. Um, you know, I used to cover football uh, a lot more exclusively um, uh, in the past, but uh, yeah, de- definitely, you know, it's been, been an up and down ride for, for Syracuse football there. You know, we had the, the good season a uh, year before last, uh, but this year was, uh, was a little bit challenging, and you know, that's kind of been the recent past for us. So, uh, yeah, you know, it's, it's definitely good to, to uh, support uh, a franchise, uh, you know, a team that wins as consistently as Syracuse basketball has. <laughs> Let me ask you, you are an SU grad. Do you think Dino Babers is the guy to get the SU Orange back in the top 25? Yeah, I, I definitely do. Uh, you know, I like Dino Babers a lot. Um, you know, I think that uh, he's had a lot of big upset wins just in his short time here. You know, we also uh, beat Virginia Tech. Uh, we almost beat Clemson two other times as well. Um, you know, so I mean, like, I think he's done a really great job with the program. I think that uh, the situation is more uh, just the fact that we were irrelevant for so many years and we just got so far behind some of the other uh, teams. Uh, you know, in the ACC and even in the Big East when we were there, uh, that it, we've been just kind of trying to play catch up. Uh, you know, we're, we're, we're starting to recruit some better guys and the strength and conditioning work, uh, for, our, for Baylor staff, I think they've done a tremendous job there. Um, but you know, they just got some work to do. I know they're losing a, a lot of guys this year. Um, but, uh, you know, there's still a really solid core there. And, uh, you know, if we can get the, the offensive line to be a little bit more, uh, more together this coming year, uh, you know, I could, I could see them having a good season. The one glaring issue in my mind for SU football is getting that top recruit at the quarterback position. Now, you could say Ryan Nassib was a good quarterback. He did go in the NFL draft. He was a backup for the Giants and the Buccaneers. Eric Dungy was a nice quarterback. He wasn't a quarterback. Cal- he wasn't an NFL caliber quarterback, but we saw as you fell off the table without Dungy at quarterback with DeVito under center this year. Just like the NFL at the college level, 
You have to have a top-level quarterback if you're going to be in the top 25 and if you're going to be in the college football playoffs. A lot of people tell me, you know, well, you know, SU's at a disadvantage. They're in the Northeast and, you know, players from the South and the West don't want to come to Syracuse and trudge through the snow to class and to the Dome and While that might be part of it, and and maybe there's not a lot of great football players in the Northeast, although you got to win your backyard first. You got to win New York, Pennsylvania, Massachusetts, New Jersey, Connecticut, and get the best recruits out of those states. But if that was true, you know, Minnesota is turning around. You know, they have a dome and they're in an area where it's pretty cold uh, in the fall and in the winter. Boise State, you know, I mean, we can keep going on where there are teams that are in, you know, not Florida and Georgia and California and Texas that still get good recruits. I just believe that Syracuse has struggled. They've not been in the top 25, so they're not on TV much when they are on TV and they play a top team outside of that Clemson win a couple years ago when the Orange beat Clemson when they were number one. They have been boat raced in a lot of these games where they play ranked teams. And when you're a recruit and you're a kid and you see that, you're not going to be like, hey, I want to go, you know, play for them. Unless you're like, well, geez, I can't go play for Florida or Florida State or Alabama or Clemson. So, hey, maybe I can go play for Syracuse. They need my help. Do you think it is just the cold weather and in, 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 in that the Orange have not been in the top 25? Is that the reason they're not getting the top level recruits? I mean, you know, if you look back at, at Syracuse football historically, uh, we had one of the more impressive programs for, for, for decades. We were actually very similar to basketball with the, the winning seasons. You know, when we had Paul Pasqualoni and, you know, even well before that, we had, uh, you know, just so much success in the past. And again, some of the, the best players uh, to ever play the game, Jim Brown, Ernie Davis, you know, I mean, like, the, the legacy is absolutely there. So, um, you know, I think it's, I, I think, you know, we just need to get back to uh, recruiting a little bit better. We're starting to get there. You know, we, we got some interest from uh, some of the, the higher three and lower four star guys. We just got to keep making those incremental uh, gains there. And uh, I think, you know, if we can, keep that consistent over uh, a couple of years, you know, we will start start to see those more consistent improvements. Dave, one last question. The NCAA has given a waiver to spring athletes. They'll get an extra year. Do you believe they will give a waiver for the winter sports athletes who are seniors? Uh, You know, honestly, I I personally don't think that they will. Um, you know, I think it's challenging, but uh, they really only missed the the postseason, which obviously is pretty pretty terrible for seniors. And I would not be opposed at all if they did give a waiver uh, specifically to the seniors there. Um, I don't think it's been decided officially. I'm not positive about that either way. But uh, I, personally, I, I don't see it happening. Uh, I think there just wasn't enough of the season missed to. Uh, to, to have that, and I think you know a lot of the seniors that uh, that would have benefited from that are either entering their name in the draft or you know getting their degree in four years and probably ready to move on. Uh, so you know that that's kind of my take on it. Dave, great job, my friend. I encourage people to go to noonsmagician.com. Get your SU sports information, news, content at noonsmagician.com. Dave, listen, thanks so much for coming on, my friend. Stay healthy, and we'll chat soon. Yeah, thanks uh, Thanks so much for having me. And, uh, yeah, back at you. Stay, stay healthy yourself there. All righty, let's take a break. We'll be back with more on 92 on the team. With some recent revisions, our certificate sale is still going on. Save up to 50% off your favorite restaurant or local business. Pay online and we'll ship the certificates to you at no extra charge. Go to www.921theteam.com and click on Certificate Sale. Buy the certificate you want and request that they be shipped. Let us help you save money. And thanks for listening to 921 The Team. Our veterans risked it all to protect our freedoms. And now, as we all fight the coronavirus, vulnerable veterans have little or no contact with their family or hospital volunteers and staff. Learn how you can help an isolated or sick veteran at HealVets.org. Help Heal Veterans with the support of citizens like you. Creates, manufactures, and distributes therapeutic art and crafts projects for our veterans and military at no charge to them. HealVets.org. This... That's the way you talk. 
Welcome back to the Joel and Show. On 92.1 The Team. Welcome back, everybody. It is uh, the Joel Orion Show along with Tanner Saunders. Tanner, I forgot to ask you. The show's been going by so fast. Real quickly, um, what is the Tanner trivia question today? Do you have it? Yes, sir. And I personally think it's a good one, but uh, I'll let you be the judge of that, and I'll run it by you here. So to give this a little context, I went to bed last night at around shortly after 9 p.m. and woke up at about 4 in the morning, and, you know, I went on YouTube, and I was missing the NBA, as is every other person on the planet right now, so I was watching some old NBA highlights, and I was thinking, man, this would be a great time if the season was still going on. You know, the final seeds would be getting decided, and the playoffs would be starting, and one of the highlights I saw inspired me for today's trivia question, so here we go. In NBA history, there have been five players who have hit walk-off series winning shots. So five players have hit walk-off series ending shots in NBA history. Only one player has done it multiple times. Who is that player? And I will give you a hint. It is an active player. Mm, Okay, it is an active player. I would have guessed MJ, of course. That's always the go-to, but that's not him, okay? All right. Interesting. An active player. Uh, okay, I think I might know one. Okay, maybe. Um, let me think about that, and uh, we'll give that answer here at the uh, end of the show as uh, we uh, rapidly approach the end of the show. And uh, we're still going to try to slide in here the, um, uh, the the Ronald Reagan Jelly Bean Challenge, where Tanner will try to get as many jelly beans in his mouth as he can while saying Ronald Reagan, uh, President Reagan's famous line, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down that wall. Um, so we'll, we'll try to slide that in. Now, I was thinking, Tanner, because um, somebody asked me this. Um, I don't know if I, I could do this. 